All right, first thing I want to say is to everybody, thank you. The last fly tying video, yeah, I'm doing a fly tying video. Don't panic. There's going to be some fishing tips in the end of this or in it. Um, that was great. Great comments. Um, the viewership was good. So thank you very much for everybody that watched it and gave me comments. I, they're really useful. So I do enjoy your comments. So put them down there. Uh, couple announcements we still have hats we got an order you know imagine a fly box being right there we got some fly boxes on order that should be in the next couple of days the other thing is is we are planning on doing our um, August last weekend of August for the upcoming um, 22 you know, 2022 season we're going to be doing the um, fly casting clinic so that's coming up this August uh, if you're interested please send us an email get a contact we'll put you on a list um, it's going to be it's a limited entry we keep each day to 10 students it's a five on one me and Ricky do the instruction so there's one instructor to five students it's really gives a lot of one-on-one -on -one instruction we run one on Saturday and we run a second one on Sunday so that'll be the last weekend in August once again if you're interested just contact us drop us an email we'll get you on the list We'll start taking confirmed bookings probably in June. So that's coming up. Uh, the um, other thing is is our books are open. We're, um, it's mid-February, um, so we're definitely booking for the spring. And we got slots open for the spring. And um, obviously our pike fishing in May and June. And, our, of course, all of our trout fishing through the summer. And then our fall campaign for uh, the salmon and steelhead. So all the books are open. We're filling up. So if you want, give us a call. Um, we'll get you um, on board with that too. So once again, um, I'm going to do a little pause and emerge, and you'll see me um, introducing the fly time video. Hope you enjoy it. As always, hit the little subscribe button and the bell icon because we got a lot more coming, and we're going to do a bunch of fishing this spring. I am eagerly waiting to get on the water. See you, folks. Okay, folks, I'm going to do another uh, fly time video. Uh, the last one went over really well. I got some great comments. Um, the viewership on it wasn't too bad for us for a fly time video, so thank you. Here's the next one. Um, this time I'm going to do a, uh, a nymph, and it's one of my, what I call my hot stones. Um, they're tied with a little bit of color in them. Uh, and this one right here I'm going to show you is, uh, is done in the pink. It's got the pink bead, the pink goose by it, the pink ribbing in it, of course the pink um, wing case on a black base. Now these still had like their flies um, blinged up a little bit, kind of like bikers, they like their bling. So 
This one is tied on an 8. That's generally what I use uh, for this. I'm going to show some dubbing techniques. And as always, for you guys that are not fly tires or interested in fly tying or very good tires, not interested in seeing how it's tied, I do have, after the tying section, how I fish the fly. So I'm going to continue doing that. Uh, so a couple of notes about um, winter steelhead and nymphs. You know, as much as we love to swing flies, very often during the winter, that water temperature gets so cold that these fish are really not too interested in chasing swinging flies. And specifically the Salmon River in general, of course this is where this fly I usually use is on the salmon in the, on the upper mid upper part of the river. The bug life in that river is incredible. There's a lot of bugs and the stonefly pot numbers in there are immense. And the longer a steelhead sits in our, in our rivers, our tributaries, the more they start acting like wintering spring creek trout. They get hyper keyed in on a food source and they'll start uh, keying in and sipping on those things. So you got to be right on your game. Your presentation's got to be perfect. Your flies got to be pretty closely matched to what they're looking for. We do get away with it. The, they're still steelhead. They like color. That's why I put that in there. But they do get really dialed in. So this fly pattern I use kind of like midwinter to late winter, sometimes early spring, when the bugs start to, or when our stoneflies start to get pretty active. At the time of filming this, we're mid um, February middle of winter uh, it won't be too much longer usually late February March the Sam River has what I call a winter stone flies hatch they're small they get active they get crawling and he still had to get dialed in and these flies work really good so you get a day there that's in the upper 20s low 30s the sun shines on the water those nymphs are going to start crawling those steelhead are going to start looking for them and actually I'm um, keying on just like a trout in a spring creek during the winter so I'm going to get tying this and talking about the fly. All right, we're going to tie this stone fly. And um, I got Eric running the camera, so we'll be communicating back and forth. I'm going to try to get some close-up shots and show some material handling. But anyways, this is that stone. Hopefully it'll look like this when we get done. So I'm going to start out. Um, the hook I'm using is a uh, Daiichi uh, 1120 in size 8. And um, I get this in here. We're using a 1 8 chartreuse bead. If I remember correctly, when I get done, hopefully I'll put all the hands up. Yeah, I'm trying to bead these up. He's yelling me to stay in the camera, put the bead on. I'll try to put the in the description the recipe for this fly. But, anyways, and then we're going to use some good old uni black thread. But we'll just get tying along on this thing. For you guys that are either know how to tie good or non-fly tires, I don't want to bore you too much, but we'll just move right along on this thing. For you fly tires, I am going to show you a couple um, uh, techniques, material handling techniques. The goose biots right here, the chartreuse biots, they have a slight curve, and we're going to use that curve to our advantage. There goes an extra. And get them divide there. There's a slight, I don't know if you can see it on the camera, there's a slight upward curve. And I like to use that, have the tie in kind of cross and have that curve go up a little bit. Focusing. My hands get away, I probably mess up with the camera here. And, uh, whoops, one's long here. Focusing. Well, well it's a little out of hand here. There we go. Get it back in there. Tie it down lengthwise. For this chartreuse hot stone, obviously I'm doing it in chartreuse, so I'm going to put a wire in. I'll do that next. I like to put that lunette on the side here. Now this is, this fly is a dubbed body fly, so basically there's some dubbing that I've made myself. It's a home brewed. If you want me to show you how I mix the dubbing up, just say something in the comments and I'll do a little video on, on how I mix up dubbing. So this is just a a um, blend that I do myself right here for this fly. Now a lot of people struggle with dubbing, so I'm going to show you a little tip on the dubbing. Notice I got a little wafer. I don't have a ball. I got almost like a chip, almost like a potato chip. And you can see how it's also really fine on the edges and not thick. 
for the thorax, the back part of the fly here, I want it kind of thin and tight. So I'm going to do a tight dub. I'm going to start right on the edge, lick my fingers, get a little bit of a tactical or stick to it. And you notice how it's, I'm putting it on kind of thin and I'm working off from the edge of the chip of dubbing. And just putting a tiny bit on at a time. I probably just dubbed right off the camera um, lens here. And I'll go up and down this a couple of times. Just get it as tight as I can and pack it on. Now I'm a little bit heavy, but I'm not going to worry about it. And I'll make a pass. Now, come back through. Got some extra, get rid of it. Now because I want this body tight, it's a stone fly, I kind of like a tighter back end. I'll actually take and wrap this black thread over the top of the black dubbing and kind of pack it down. The other thing you'll note is how far I went through the thorax. If you read your fly tying books, they say proportions are to be two-thirds, one-third. Ignore it. Go for 50-50. And I want the front and the abdomen to be a little bit fatter than the back, so I'll actually dub right past it and it gives me some room to work. Now I went this way with the thread. I'm going to go the opposite direction with the wire for two things. One is the wire will stay on top of the body and be more visible. Also it gives us a little bit of structural strength to the fly. And I go right past the halfway mark. Tie it in. A couple of turns with wire it's easy to get it anchored in good. Now I'm going to bring the thread back to the halfway mark. Now for the wing case, in this case right here, I'm using some, um, this is chartreuse uh, crystal, or flashaboo, you can use crystal flash, whatever you have on hand, just something flashy. I think I got eight or ten strands in there. If it gets a little hand, lick your fingers, put a little slive on it. Remember, slive is our friend. And I'll go wrap it right onto here, go over the top, and I'll go right back to the halfway point. Now for the fuzzy part of the front of the fly, we're going to go right back and this time we're going to do a sloppy job of dubbing. I'm going to put it on a little bit more aggressively and I'm just going to twist it on gently and leave it really fluffy. See how I'm just not overly working it? And a little tip is right on the end here, on the bottom, just kind of get it tw twisted in kind of tight. I don't know Eric if you need to zoom out to see that or not. See right here in the bottom I got it kind of tight and then it's really kind of um, rank and out of control through the rest of it. And then I'll just kind of put it on as a giant pea. And that little leftover right there in the front, I'll just leave it there. And since I'm working behind the bead, that stuff is clean. Focusing. Alright, let Eric focus back in on what's going on. Yeah. Working on a small fly and the camera doesn't always like small flies. That helping? Yes. There you go. I'll just bring the wing case back over. And I got a little bit of dubbing left. It's kind of in and out. Better. And it, it just kind of helps fills in behind the um, the uh, the bead there. Then what I'll do is I'll kind of come and split the volume of the flashaboo kind of half one way, half the other. And I'll make I'll pull them over along the sides like legs. Right back down. I can get over there with your blonde. If you don't like where your fly time with trails, grab a hold of it and just put it there. We're bigger than it is. We'll just manhandle it. And I'll just tie back on it a little bit so I got the wings, or AK legs, almost like side wings. And then I'll just kind of fill in behind the bead there a little bit. Go find my whip finish tool. Get this stuff out of the way. And I'll just kind of whip right behind the bead several turns. You know, we can kind of build up that thread, hold that bead in place, come back. And then what I do is grab everything and I kind of come back just a little bit past where the wing case is, give it a nice clip. And then I always like to hook on my whip finish tool, use it as a little dubbing thing, tease out the dubbing line to size for legs. If you got a little extra dubbing in there, that's great. You just kind of pull it out and pluck it out. and It's easier to remove the dubbing than if you got too much than it is to put to try to pack it in there if you don't have enough. 
and you just got a little grooming job and there's our hot stone nip. You know, I got a little carried away with the dub in here, but we'll just keep grooming it until it looks right. Legs got tucked in out of the way, we'll pluck them out so they look there we go. There's our hot stone and chartreuse. Alright, how I rigged this thing. Alright. Let's get some focus here. Okay, how I'm gonna rig and fish this stone fly. As you can tell right now, um, I got it basically tied on a standard tippet. Well, not a standard tippet. This is actually Maxima Chameleon um, 10 pound. And I'm using this because it's visible. I don't fish with such a heavy stuff. It almost looks like it's on tied on haywire. It's so stiff. So this is usually I, I'll use um, 3x and 4x tippet. 4x tippet on these big fish, you got to be a little bit careful, but 3x is kind of standard for this. And I'll use a more of a clear or a fluorocarbon tippet. Uh, and um, usually 3x works pretty good on these size 8s. But if the fish get crabby, I'll go to 4x. And what I'm going to do is just run a 30 inch tippet to a standard. In this case, it's a double uni. It goes on to my leader, and then I put my shot above it. And we're, we're old schooling with this nymph. We're going to use the weight to get down. We're going to dead drift these things. And we're going to use a long leader. Generally my leader lengths on these things are 12 foot, 10 to 12 foot leaders. I do have a video of me tying my leaders in the um, technique section column of the um, YouTube channel. So I do have a, a uh, leader uh, video up where I hand time. So that's tied to this and it goes to that 10 foot leader. Obviously here's the tippet knot with a shot and then on to about a 10 to 12 foot leader depending on where I'm fishing and the type of water I'm in. From there on the leader I do use with, the, with these flies get back to my fly here I do very often fish these things with strike indicators. I use a large variation of strike indicators different designs there's a lot of designs you can use it's just for the most part it's a personal preference so just very often that people say, well, what strike indicators use? Use what you're comfortable with, but I do like something that's pretty buoyant. Uh, right here, um, this is a Raven float. It's a 2.2 2 .2 milligram. This is a standard one I use. I will use them right up to a 5 milligram, depending if I have to fish deep, very heavy water, very deep water, and I got to drive the fly down a little bit more weight and then we usually are comfortable with and but that's for tough situations what I like about this and yes I do borrow this from the center pin folks is that with the rubber tubes here and here you can slide it up and down your leader really easily when you're fishing indicators and in this type of um, nymph rigs for winter steelhead you're constantly adjusting you're constantly adjusting your weight and you're constantly adjusting your drop from the floats and very often I'll fish a little dirty secret I fish just a little heavier and probably I should just a touch and then I carry the weight suspend it under the float so that I'm barely making contact with the bottom and the float is probably running up like this I know I'm getting a good drift a nice soft drift and I can pick up those really soft winter takes a lot easier plus you want to get your fly down fishing as fast as possible so sometimes lighter leaders, lighter tippets help you get down and then you can suspend your weight, stay out of, keep from getting snagged and snagging fish by suspending everything under the float and just kind of keeping that weight just off the bottom and letting that nymph, aka our little hot stone, um, drifting pretty um, freely. Other floats that I use is the thingamabobber. The problem with these things is you got to loop them on and unloop them so they're a little bit rough a little bit of an issue to um, adjust but in skinny water when you're only fishing a couple of feet of depth these things can be nice and you know they're pretty buoyant and they cast good I mean these things look clunky but they surprisingly cast really well and another one is pretty much akin cousin to the thingamabobber it's got the little screw top which is kind of nice you can loosen it slide your tip it up or your leader up and down and adjust screw it back down and adjust it. I like these because they are fairly easy 
I like these things. However, I just got pocketfuls of these things right here, but I do like these because they are easier to um, adjust. And of course, this type of rig right here is one of my favorites. And they come with a bunch of different sizes. Smaller, skinny water. I'll run this, this tiny little one milligram um, float. And you'd be surprised on a five weight how well that'll cast. So they do cast really good. These little rubber um, tubes make it real easy to adjust. So these are the indicators I use. And basically what I figure my depth for my floats, I figure the depth of the water plus about 20-30%. Uh, if you're really fast, you may have to go depth plus 50%, but generally I like to run about 20 or 30% because I'm fishing for some pretty, you know, look, yeah, we all know how soft those winter steelhead takes can be. And if I got more of a direct connection from least the weight to the float, then I can pick those soft takes up a lot quicker and a little bit easier. So these are the floats that I use. To recap, um, generally what I'll do, just a quick recap here. Generally what I do with my nymphs, in this case I got a nice little orange hot bead here. That's what I grabbed from my demonstrations. I'll fish um, about 30 inches to the weight, from the fly to the weight, and then I'll run about a 10 foot 12 foot leader depending on the conditions I'm in. And very often with these flies I'm running 3x, 4x tippet which is about 8 pound, 6 pound. Um, generally your 6 pound your 4x works a little bit better especially in those soft takes. Just fish a light rod and just be careful when you set the hook that you don't pull too hard and you'll be fine. So that's how I set them up. That's how I use them. Hope that is helpful. Hope you find, enjoyed it. You can see I'm right back at my mess here. I hope you um, enjoyed this video. I hope you found it helpful. Please leave a comment on the end. Tell us what you like, uh, what you don't like. Obviously, these videos are for you, so your feedback is always helpful. We had some great feedback in the last one. Uh, going forward, weather should be changing. It is middle of March. We should be breaking out of these already grips here pretty soon, and it'll be time to get on the water and put this fly to work. So once again... Um, we've got a lot of fishing coming up, so hit that subscribe button and that bell icon because we're going to be sending a lot more fly tying videos of the same format and we're going to be fishing soon. So see you folks. See you in the water. This is Jay at JPEC Guides in Lost River Fishing. We are a year-round fly fishing catch and release guide service. We fish the Lake Ontario tributaries. And then during the spring and the summer, we also fish the inland trout streams classic dry fly fishing. During the heat of the summer we'll do the warm water fishing for bass and pike. If you're interested in any of our islands or have any questions please feel free to email us at fish at lostriversfishing.com. Hope to hear from you and if you have any questions feel free to contact us.